Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Hudson Theaters. Um, and welcome to Fringe Number Seven. Uh, all of us at the Hudson, my name is Mike. I'm the the one of the theater managers here. Um, why, thank you, Mike. Um, all of us at the Hudson are huge fans of Fringe. Um, you know, for the month of June, Theater Row really comes alive. It comes alive with community, with collaboration, um, and it's fun. Um, and the one thing I love about Fringe, and I've been actively participating in it for this entire seven years it's been in existence now, is just that sense of family that gets created. Um, it's not about my show's better than yours, or you know I have the greatest thing. It's really about a bunch of artists coming together for one month out of the year to really celebrate live theater. Um, and not just in Los Angeles, but around the world. Um, it's a truly wonderful time for Theater Row, and we are so appreciative of people behind us, of the entire Fringe Committee, for just helping revitalize LA theater. Um, so welcome. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor to Megan, who's going to get the panel started. That was like the best intro. My intro is not going to be as good as yours. Um, I do want to say thank you so much to Mike and the Hudson. Um, we also love you guys. Thank you for having us here. Love you guys. Thank you all for coming. Um, can I get a show of hands uh, for anyone who is a first-time fringer? because it's your first time, know that you are among many friends. Um, and those of us who are not doing it for the first time are also your friends. Um, <laughs> as a heads up, I'm going to let you guys know, we also need to wrap today promptly. There's a show coming in here at 4 p.m. and we all know what it's like to come into a theater and people aren't out of your space yet. So, uh, yeah, it's terrible. So we are going to cut the Q&A a little, like five minutes earlier than we normally do. And then instead of standing in here and chatting with each other, we will boot you out and encourage you to come to the mixer, which I will tell you about in a second. Um, I, my name is Megan McCauley. I'm the outreach director for the Hollywood Fringe Festival. I've been involved in the festival also for seven years. Um, it was what brought me to Los Angeles and in, um, oftentimes why I stay. Um, and I love this festival very much. Um, and I want to introduce the other staff who is here today, festival staff. So where are you guys? We have Dave here. You want to introduce him? <laughs> you introduced me. This is Dave. He's the produ producing. producing director of the Hollywood Fringe Festival and one of the co-founders. Um, we have here in the front Ellen Denherder. She's the outreach coordinator. First year on staff. She will also be live tweeting today. And then Stina. Right here. Hey, I'm um, Stina Peterson. I'm the volunteer director. We're going to spend about 45 to 50 minutes of doing a panel discussion. I'm going to ask questions, and then these wonderful people behind me are going to answer those questions. Then there will be about 45 minutes afterwards of Q&A, where you can ask questions, and they will also answer them. Um, after this, we are having a mixer at three clubs. They are doing happy hour specials, which is $5 classic cocktails. And there's nothing Ooh. like a Manhattan at like 4.30 PM. Um, it's just down. Santa Monica at Vine, so we'll all walk over there together afterwards. We are selling the classic black and white fringe tea today for $12. If anyone wants to buy one, you can. If you don't want to buy one today, you will eventually want to, <laughs> but there's no pressure. Um, we do want to, we're going to keep our comments here and our questions. I encourage you also to keep them sort of, not sort of, keep them constructive in general as much as possible. If you have a really, really specific question about something that maybe is something you definitely need an answer to but might not be something everyone needs an answer to, um, we do encourage you to also email support at hollywoodfringe.org. We are answer that email rap with rapid fire speed. Maybe um, even while you're sitting here. Maybe even while we're sitting here. Yeah, we're very quick with that. Um, but we do want to keep everything general and keep it constructive. If you have like a horror story about something that happened to you at the Fringe Festival, um, one, I'm very sorry, and two, um, feel free to share it as long as, as what you learned from that would be helpful for others. Um, we have a few upcoming events I'm going to let you know about. Our first HFF 16 Twitter chat 
is Monday, March 21st at 2 p.m. Twitter chat is when we all get online and talk to each other through the internet at the same time. Um, <laughs> to do that, you follow the hashtag HFF16. Anytime you post anything about the Fringe on social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, please do use that hashtag. It's how we find each other in the World Wide Web and how we make our, start making friendships when we can't see each other all the time on events like this. Um, so also follow, follow at Hollywood Fringe on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook, please. A week from today is the, our second town hall. The town halls are a little different than this. The town hall is led by our festival director, Ben Hill. Um, that is all about marketing, and he will give more, he'll give like a town hall, he'll orate beautifully to us for an hour. So there's no panel <laughs> discussion. It's just Ben and all of his expertise and knowledge. And then also a Q&A. So that's a really, really useful event to attend. We really encourage it. That's next Saturday at 3 p.m. at the Dragonfly. Nope, here. Oh, here? Yeah, here in a, different, here. In oh, a I'm sorry. different space. Use the, the other Hill says hashtag. At here. It's at here. Okay, thank you. I apologize. Um, April 1st is the registration for your guide entry. So make sure that at, right now as you're thinking about your show, you're editing your text, whatever you have online for your project, and if you're registered by April 1st, that is what... Well, that's technically not true. You want to register your show by April 1st to get in the guide. Then we give you a, a little bit of time after that to make sure all of your text is final. April 1st. Registration deadline to be in the guide. You can register after that. You just won't be in the printed book Last announcement second to last announcement um, at the end of this month. We are beginning office hours again. Does anyone remember those from Ooh, last year? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so office hours are what we refer or what we call uh, bar <coughs> mixers So we drink together every single Wednesday starting on March 30th um, Every Wednesday starting then up until fringe at a different bar throughout Hollywood and we will start at three clubs So Wednesday 3 30 we will be drinking about fringe at 7 p.m. at three clubs That's the hashtag for that one drinking about fringe It's a very useful skill to have um, All right, I'm gonna uh, introduce a friend Michael Coughlin is here from backstage and he has a little announcement for fringers this year Michael Hi everybody, my name is Michael Coughlin. I'm the theater and performing arts casting editor for backstage and we love the Fringe, we love events and theaters, and uh, today's workshop is online in promotion, and you know the deadline is April 1st. If you still are casting for your project, or if you're a one-man person, or a one-woman person show, and you still need crew for your project, we will post your casting notice for free. The code is HFF2016, and you will post uh, a notice online, and that will be covered for free. If I come across it, I'll put it, I'll feature it, I'll print it for you. We're also a magazine. And uh, we just really love the community here and we want to help you as much as we can. I have uh, business cards with codes if you didn't write it down. Again, it's HFF 2016. Um, you can reach me uh, at my email on my business card. I'd be happy to help you out. And uh, good luck everybody this year. Thanks for having me. Thank So I'm going to have these amazing panelists introduce themselves here, um, and I'm going to start with Greg. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'll keep it short, I promise. Uh, my name is Gregory Crafts. I'm Managing Director of Theatre Unleashed, based in North Hollywood. I've been uh, participating in the Hollywood Fringe since its inception in 2010. Uh, I am also on the Board of Directors for the Theatrical Producers League of Los Angeles. So, yes? uh, I was brief. Yeah, yeah, remarkable, right? Yeah. He's so surprised. <laughs> uh, my name is Monica Miklas. Uh, I have produced in every fringe up to now. Um, for the first five years, I was producing with a music and sketch comedy company called Lost Moon Radio. Uh, we went top of the fringe in 2012, which is pretty awesome. Uh, last year, I produced a show with my new company, Capital W. Uh, the show was called Hamlet Mobile. It was <laughs> um, a staging of Hamlet in a converted utility van. Um, so I'm your alternative venue. Um, I also help uh, organize a series of creative panels in the fall. I think I recognized you guys. You were there, right? In the fall? Those panels? Oh, don't they? Fall. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. And I do some light volunteering around. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ed Goodman. Um, I, uh, I've been doing The Fringe since 2013. Uh, I was, at, uh, was absolutely filthy. Uh, and then um, next year we did Toddler Bangs America, which um, for, uh, I can never do now, but 
Tyler Bangs is real and walking around and giving speeches. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> last year we did the Poe Show and uh, one of the best com comedy of the French last year. Uh, and, uh, and a word that meant a lot to Ed. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, wording, the wording of it was strange. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, I'm doing a show this year. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, should we give, like if we want to give our email, do we do it now? Or do I ask a question in the panel to make it obvious that now is the time to give my email? You can do that now. My email is uh, egoodness at gmail.com. Uh, and I love talking about the fringe. I love being real geeky about the fringe. Um, so uh, feel free to email me about anything at all. Uh, I've been a director, uh, an assistant director, a performer, a writer, um, and uh, think of office hours as drinking practice. <laughs> because that's going to be important when you're talking to people after shows and stuff and you want to get to know people, you have to be able to do it drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and on a laugh, I'm done! <laughs> Hi, I'm Kath Primo. I've been lurking around the fringe since it began as well. Um, I wrote for Bitter Lemons for a little while in LATheaterReview.com. And I produced Girl Band in the Men's Room, which won Best in Theater 2011, uh, and also performed in it. And last year I produced and performed Time Heart, which was an original musical um, comedy uh, with Robot Teammate and the Accidental Party. And we are coming back with the show. Um, this year, another original musical Boy. out of our crazy improvisations, and um, so I'm excited to participate again. And uh, I love the French. <laughs> My name is Mason Flink. I'm the artistic director at the Norton School for the Occasionally Self-Employed. <laughs> uh, we're an, art an arts collective that collaborates across film, theater, and music. Last year, I was it was my first Fringe, and I produced, directed, and co-wrote Max and Elsa, No Music, No Children. Um, and we had the honor of being the most nominated show at last year's festival. And I'm excited to be here to share. I'm not doing a show this year, but I'm happy. Any questions, I'm excited to answer. Thank you all so much. Okay, round of applause for them. <laughs> Venue management. This is a time when many people here might have a venue or might still be looking for a venue. Um, but do you guys have any great tips for how to get one? I know there's a lot of producers <coughs> in the festival, and sometimes it can be hard to get the right space. Do you guys have tips for how to get the right venue? Um, I think consider the needs of your show. You know, uh, some I, I've talked with a lot of different producers about their productions and what it is they're planning on bringing. Uh, and sometimes, uh, oh God, I had a great train of thought. It just totally got derailed. Great way to start. <laughs> um, you know, if you, if you know that you need to have an aisle to run a chase through an aisle, make sure that you've got an aisle. You know, I mean, consider the, consider the physical needs. And actually, I always recommend going and trying to take a tour of the space before you you uh, before you sign in there. Don't unless you can't avoid it. Don't ever sign something blind. You know. Yeah, I agree that whatever suits your show and going to see it, you can kind of get the vibe of the space because you really want to create an environment and an experience in the fringe. And if you can do that with walking into the space and how the space feels, that will just serve your show, your show that much better. Mason may be able to speak to venue size a little bit. Yes, so um, in deciding what space that we were going to have a big component was how many seats were there. and. As a first-time producer, we and Monica gave us great advice last year, which was to like aim smaller than you think that you can get because if you can create a sense of scarcity for your tickets, it helps sort of like propel momentum for actually selling out the show, which we were able to do very quickly because we chose a smaller space. And it, 40 seats seems like a lot, but that was the perfect number for us. So just know based on how many people are in your show, just do like a little bit of mental math about if each person has like 20 people that they would reach out to um, in terms of your cast and crew, then you can sort of measure like how many seats total that you would need to sell. So size is definitely really important. You guys added performances during the run of the festival. We did. You? Yeah. We did. If you, if, you have, if you have a small enough venue and you're selling it out, that is a possibility, you know, and, and that is, yeah. uh, 
having have, you can't buy that kind of marketing momentum. Okay, that that is just power when you have that. And once we expanded, then it, then we went to a theater that was eighty seats, and that was because we knew that we had spaces to fill. But really, picking a forty seat theater was like, essential to our success last year. Cool. Um, do you have any tips for how to make yourself well liked at your venue? Like, they, there are a lot of different artists who are working there with you. Like, how do you, like, do you bake them things? Do you, like, I don't know. How do you get, how do you get in good with your venue manager? How are you? A good, how do you be a good kid? Uh, I would say one thing. Like, oh, it starts with the tour. Uh, think of it in in this way. You need them, and you need them to be on your side. And things are going to go wrong. Just write that in your notebook right now. Yeah, things are going to go wrong. <laughs> And the venue and their managers and their staff and their people are all there to help those things move along. And they know things that you need to know. So starting with the tour, befriend them. Go to all the venues will have open houses and things like this. They'll have talkbacks. They'll have tech, uh, tech meetings and all that kind of stuff. Regardless of whether you're the tech guy with your show, go to those meetings. When you show up in force, when you walk in the door with five people, you got a producer, you got a writer, you got a tech guy, you got then you're showing them that you're serious and that you mean business and they respect that. And then when the chaos ensues, you know somebody's first name, you know their phone number, you know where to get to them. Um, they're part of your team. So treat them like part of your team. Um, the, I've been at venues that have uh, sort of subtly um, suggested that a big bottle of uh, nice alcohol helps. Um, <laughs> That can bite you on the ass when they consume all that alcohol right before your show. <laughs> but um, but it, it starts with the tour, I think. And then realize you're going to be with these people till the end of June if you extend through July. So um, that's, that's one thing that the Fringe is really good at, like team, crew. Like that's who, that's, they're going to be early people on your team and they're vital. Yeah. So. Yeah. I would just to go even one step further that, because that's really good advice, is be realistic about your needs too, so that you, you know what to ask for. Um, because if you, if you think critically about your technical needs a week earlier than you need to, you're gonna be able to go into those conversations knowing how to advocate for yourself, and people respect that and respond to it if you're able to speak intelligently about what you're walking into, and if you're, new to theater or first time producer, um, finding someone who can help you and help you think of what questions to ask, that can be really helpful too. And I think, I know I would be more than happy to think like, these are the things I'd ask, and I'm sure these folks would too, if you're like, but gosh, I don't even know where to start. Yeah. What questions do I think? I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, quick show of hands, how many of you guys are still looking for a venue? Everybody else has already signed. Oh, wow. Oh, good. Oh, good. That's great. All right. It's okay. Just open. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for those of you who already have your venues, yeah. Uh, be, here's one of the big things. Remember that you are sharing that space with 20 other shows uh, or more, that the staff there is working around the clock. You know, there's going to be things that are going to be disorganized sometimes. There's sometimes there's going to be things going wrong with other shows. Sometimes people are going to be having bad days. My recommendation is be patient. Be understanding, be firm in your needs, but don't be demanding, be polite, be respectful. Just remember that these guys are working their asses off to make sure that everything flows correctly, you know, and they're doing the best that they can. So be as, be as patient as humanly possible and understanding with that. And they'll love you for that, you know, and they'll appreciate you for that. And uh, yeah, if Aaron Lyons is your tech director, a good bottle of whiskey is uh, really well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I would also say during the actual festival itself, the two big things are always be on time. Yes. And in the rehearsal process at the very end, build in practice of like loading in and loading out your space. Do it in your rehearsal space, have your stage manager and the director like make a plan and then assign people very specific tasks because it is pure chaos when you have a Time it. maybe three well, last year we were in a space that had four different theaters so you had people loading and unloading that's like eight groups at once and you have to be organized and I would also say aim for your preview to be treated as your opening night we came in really hot and super tight with our show on our preview and 
the, our venue rep was there and it helped them get excited about it. So if you can, think about your preview as your opening and it will make you have a higher bar for yourself in terms of your level of preparedness once you get there to open the show. Good yeah. tips. Thanks, guys. Oh, one one, one okay. that's really, really important. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead um, the 15 minute loadout, that's your time. If, if, you're, if you're following in uh, after somebody else, make sure they get their 15 minutes. Don't walk in uh, early to load in your show. The number of times I had to throw other groups out uh, of our 15 minutes while we were loading out uh, last year, that's a major faux pas. Don't do that. Don't, don't be a jerk about that. The stage manager or the house manager will let you know when it's cool to go in, but please don't infringe on other people's 15 minutes to load up. They have that time for a reason, and they need it. So that was, that was a huge issue that we had last year. What, what Greg is referring to is that at many venues, and maybe not at all, so it's good to ask your venue what the time is before and after your show, before someone else comes in. Some places the turnaround time is 15 minutes, where that's all the time you have to get in and all the time you have to get out, so it is important to respect the venue's time and the other show's time. But that's a really good thing to ask your venue about because not everyone operates exactly the same way. So um, ask, 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 they're yeah. all a little different. Um, great, so talk, let's talk about budgeting, a little bit about money. Um, everyone's favorite topic. Um, where do you guys spend and where do you guys save money? When you go into the festival knowing like, here's where I'm gonna invest in my funds in and here's what I don't need. It depends a little bit on your show and again, like what your needs are. So when I was producing a comedy show, we spent no money on costumes, none. Um, we would spend $20 on props, like that kind of stuff. But then when we did Hamlet Mobile, our set cost a lot of money because we had to retrofit a van. Um, we always spend money on insurance, it's a must. Um, that's a good one to talk to your venue about, like what the insurance picture is, if you haven't yet. Um, and then with marketing, I, I don't spend a lot on marketing. Um, I think paid advertising tends uh, not to have a, a huge return. I, I haven't found it to have a huge return. Um, postcards are a must. Plan it. It's like $60 for a thousand. You're going to spend it. You're all going to do it. Do it. And you'll have some left over. And you'll have some left over. Cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, any, any advertising or marketing that you're spending money on, think really critically about whether you think it's going to make a return and maybe ask somebody who has produced a show before if they've seen a return on it. Uh, one thing I would, um, I would really look at is postcards. What, uh, if you've ever been to a fringe venue, you see what the tables look like. They're just these tables of everybody's postcard, just stacked, or there's a wall where everybody's postcard. They're all the same size and they're all vying for attention. And your hope is that somebody's going to pick up your postcard and go, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to go buy a ticket off this postcard, which I don't think is realistic. I think what is realistic is when you meet somebody and you have a business card that has that information, your show information, you have a business card and you hand it to them and, well, yeah, like that. Um, uh, <laughs> Swing and a miss. Then you're, you're making contact with, with somebody. That, that's, that's a relationship. And that's what Fringe really allows us to do. Uh, part of what I love about Fringe is it's, it's not corporate. We're not Hollywood. In, Ho in Hollywood, you have somebody whose job is to move that light. That's all they do. So that light's going to get moved, guaranteed. Here, we got to do it all ourselves. We have to trust the person that we're having do it, do it. And we don't know what we're doing most of the time. But everybody knows what it is to get a, po to get a, a card and say, oh, uh, this is the show? Oh, uh, Oh, Hamlet Mobile, tell me about, and, and now I have a card, not a postcard, because you walk home with these 20, a stack of 20 postcards, and they go in the trash. And at the end of the night, those, you, you see them every night, they're shuffling those cards around, those cards, those cards, those cards. So try to think outside of that. Try to think of things that aren't that, because those are the things that are going to get people to remember your show, and they're going to also appreciate the effort you're putting in to not, okay, a thousand postcards, I'll dump them here, dump them there, dump stuff, da, da, ba, ba, ba. Um, I would always go smaller over postcards and then more work moving those to specific people. 
Do you do both, Ed? Like postcards and the small? Card? I do do both, but I have half the post show postcards in the back of my car right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, I, we went through a box and we got another box and then we didn't need another box. Uh, so I got, <laughs> yeah. anybody wants uh, kind of award winning so postcards <laughs> last year? I got a box. <laughs> uh, uh, He'll autograph them. Yeah. <laughs> but the calling card idea is. is yeah. is the best way to use it. It really is. Yeah. Um, cuz cuz people, you know, it's it's a it's personal Post and you can write stuff. stuff on the back, yeah. you know. To so get even more specific, Greg one year had these amazing like superhero cards that he passed out and that just like totally felt along with the marketing of the show and you could collect them. It was fun. Um, one year I did guitar picks yeah. with the name of the show on a guitar pick. Uh, last year there were a lot of coasters. You know, whatever yeah. kind of continues to fill out the world that you're creating in your show can be an extension of your marketing. But I agree that um, your venue is probably going to be the biggest chunk of change that you are spending money on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the other stuff you can handle through grassroots, through social media, through hitting the pavement and dropping off the postcards and printing posters and putting them up everywhere that you are legally allowed to. Um, you know, and really putting in the man hours, which will make up for some of those dollar hours that you would be spending on, on an ad or something. But graphic design is worth investing in. Yeah. That's good. I also think in terms of your actual production itself, like we had a peer, our show is period, and we made a very conscious choice in the design not to go full, like full set, full costumes. Um, and that saved us a lot of money. And it also, like matching that budgetary need with like a creative vision for the show can really help you be effective in saying like, okay, we're gonna create the idea or impression that we're set in 1930s Vienna, but it wasn't like a full regalia. It was very minimal and it saved us a lot of money. Yeah, now you're far out enough that if you can cut a set piece or cut a prop, do it. The less stuff you have to bring in, the less stuff you have to buy or build, the better. And you can really be evocative in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing about marketing, uh, uh, I would say the general minimize, minimize, minimize. Uh, if you've done the show before and you, you were in your own space and you had all the time in the world, and all, all right, cut all that in half. Because you got to put it in a box and move it in 15 minutes. Then you got to put it in a box and move it out in 15 minutes. So minimize, minimize, minimize. But also, uh, two things about Fringe Central. One, the drinks. Like you can sponsor a drink. If you're, and it can be kind of pricey. If you do that, be there and support it. Be there and move your drink. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you don't have a drink, be there. Commit yourself to be yeah. Fringe Central. Fringe Central. French Central is the designated bar, basically, that, that everybody either gravitates to afterwards, you go there before, get your pregame on. Commit yeah. yourself to June spending it at French Central. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the more time you spend at French Central, the more time you're meeting people, that's where, that's where buzz happens. That's where you, you meet people and you go, you're awesome, what's your show? I gotta see this show. You hear what shows are, are moving, what shows are hot, what shows are really interesting. Um, and here's something I noticed last year. Uh, I was at French Central last year, and the, the cast of King Dick rolled in, all of them, full costume, pictures, the stepping. It's a play about Elvis, right? Stepping, yeah. 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 So and Elvis Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. Yeah. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon and Elvis came into French Central and started yeah. drinking with everybody. Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> Ridiculous. So they're taking huh. pictures of, what do you call the piece of tape? Step and repeat. Step and repeat. Step and, repeat. Yeah. And, and you're watching these people, and they're rock stars. They're, they're getting a picture, and you're like, what is that? Yeah. And they look great, and that, showing up with your cast, fully ready to go, that creates an impression. People want to be involved. They're like, these people are having a ball. And that's what this whole thing is about. We're not doing this to get famous. It, I don't think it's happened yet. Is it? No, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, but, I'm very famous. Oh, okay. so, well, besides Megan. The, the impression that, like, this is the show. It's happening. It's right there. Um, that's some of the best publicity, some of the best marketing you can do is just be out there. It's like politics. Be out there and meet those people and, and, and be awesome. Yeah. Also speaking to that inch really yeah, deeply, please. you're also far out enough at this point that as you're gathering your team and everyone working on the show, 
you know, make sure that they know the commitment of being present this whole time and being present a lot of May as well and showing up because if you can get more people who are super stoked about your show doing all of that work with you, you'll save yourself a lot of time. And I know people sometimes feel a little weird about networking, um, like networking is somewhat exhausting and you don't know if you're going to whatever, it can be hard. Um, it really is a great party. It's really yeah. fun. And fun. we've met many of us, I mean all of us, have, like we're friends and we all really like each other and we all met each other here. So it's a, it's a nice central space. And you can um, meet somebody here today and the first one you go to where it's about half of them are in costume, half of them aren't, and it seems like everybody else is high school. It seems like everybody else knows each other. Get a buddy. Find somebody to go with, and then you're not alone. You're not just standing over in the end with. We'll be your buddies. Pile of cards, <laughs> going. How do I get people these cards? Well, you're just standing there. Yeah. It's it's the it's the it's the toughest thing. But it. I mean, if you think high school, first day of high school, you'll 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 do much better because everybody else is in the same boat. Everybody else is doing exactly the same thing. And we're grownups now, so no parents and no rules. Um, so I'm going to bring back, bring us back to the money, money talk, a little bit more about money talk. Um, outside of budgeting, there's also, I know a lot of people probably doing fundraising right now. Um, a lot of people, I'm starting to see them online, a lot of Kickstarter campaigns, things like that. So um, beyond Kickstarter, do you guys have creative ideas for how to raise some cash? Or do you have any stories about like something you did for a fundraiser that was really successful or something you did that was not very successful and you would not recommend it? Well, I, I am a, uh, an event fundraiser as my profession, and I can tell you that um, fundraising through events, you get a much lower return on your dollar spent. Um, like really good in fundraising events is if you spend like 30 cents to make a dollar, and usually you're spending 50 cents to make a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, so. It, it's great to search for creative ways to raise money, um, but I will say I think a, a thoughtful and well-executed um, and followed through crowdfunding campaign is, it should be, your, it should be the first thing that you consider seriously. Mm -hmm. and, and only don't go that route if you have a particular reason not to. Like with the comedy group I was in, we didn't, we've never actually done one because there's always kind of this dream of, of making a movie, and it's like, well, if we did that, we would need everybody to come to our aid then, and so we don't want to kind of burn that goodwill. So think about where you are, but, and, the, and there's kind of best practices for yeah. crowdfunding that makes it feel more special and more creative. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. um, this is my rule, but I feel like everybody gets one Kickstarter in your like twenties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my every every decade. Right now. Sure. Uh, and my co-producer, co-writer, we were very we were like this is at least actually that's not true. It was my first Kickstarter, and I knew that I was like I'm tapping the well of my like people I went to college with or parents, friends who I don't talk to, but my mom would forward an email. Like I was very specific about like this is the project I'm going to do that on. And then also, if any of you have an Aunt Nancy, I asked my aunt for money, and she gave me a check for $100, so you could ask your Aunt Nancy. <laughs> yeah. And maybe she'll I, help you. I disagree about crowdfunding, because I'm really averse to it. I think maybe once your whole lifetime. Okay. Um, but I think snail mail, if you do have people that you know can support you, that's like, it's back again. You know, like people will yeah. respond to a letter if it's very clever, and also follow through and everything. Also, I, I think events, if you can get sponsors and things covered for you. So we had a party at one of our castmates house last year. Our friends' bands played at it. We got beer sponsored from Golden Road where we performed for free all the time. So it was like, okay, let's lean on what we know we can provide and sell t-shirts and merch. And I sold guitar pick earrings that year. I did the girl band thing and made extra cash that way. You know, that there's, if you have little extras that are along the theme of your show, that you can <laughs> do them and you can lean. But that's knowing that I had an audience of people that like to party and like live music and, and that sort of thing. If your audience is different, you want to consider what's the best way to reach them. If, you, if you're not good at making videos and making campaigns, maybe consider not doing a crowdsourcing thing. You know, lean on your strengths and what you know the resources you have already, which is more than you'd think. I, I, I gotta agree with Kat. I mean, honestly, 
This time of year, my Facebook feed becomes nothing but Kickstarters. Um, and I'm an Uber driver for my day trade, so I'm broke. <laughs> and as much as I love and want to support all the artists, there's just no way in hell I can... I mean, there there was one year where, I, where almost every show I went to, my name was in the program as a, as a donor and backer, because I was like, back everything, back everything! Yeah. And it was great! Got lots of free tickets to shows, that was awesome. But it was uh, really painful for the wallet, uh, making all those pledges. Uh, so, I'm of the mind... I. The, the first year I did Hollywood Fringe and I did New York Fringe as well. I did them back to back and took a show that was, I took my show here and then to New York and that was about $12,000 and I raised that over the period of about eight months. Um, and I kickstarted about 2,500 of that. The rest of it I did, I had an angel donor uh, that was a big help who wrote a check for about $5,000 and it's like if you have that kind of connection, if this is the passion project where you think the time is now, tap it. You know, break glass in case of emergency, this is that emergency, you know, but remember that there's some of these sources you can only tap once, so make sure you're using it at the right time. Um, I, I threw a karaoke party. Uh, I had friends that ran karaoke at a bar on Monday nights, they let me do a cover in a silent auction, I got stuff donated from the place I was working at the time, this auction off, you know, I mean, their uh, yard sale, I mean, there are all different kinds of ways you can get this money. The other thing is that you can budget out how much you think this is gonna cost, uh, but there are certainly very few items that are hardline, okay, in, in budgets. Your rent. What is hardline? Uh, in, in other words, you know, that, that's going to be the cost. Okay. You know, and even still, some of them could be negotiable. Uh, your insurance, you got to pay that. Uh, your your uh, your rent. I, I I got free nights in my performance venue by volunteering and going to the lighting hangs and the work calls and stuff like that. They would take money off the rent for for the fringe rental. You know, so I mean, sometimes venues will have that available. If that's if you're on a tight budget, give them time, and time is just as good as money in some cases. Uh, in terms of set and costumes and everything else, it's amazing what you can get uh, if you ask. You know, if you ask, and if you get really creative, so you can actually cut these line item uh, line items down a little bit. Um, creativity is key here, and the the key to producing, guys. If this is your first time producing anything, all you're doing as a producer is problem solving. You know, so just be creative and be aware and be thoughtful and just know what you need and know what you have. And it's amazing what you can make happen if you just ask politely. I heard someone give the tip once in their crowdfunding campaign that one of the benefits if you donated at any level was that you got a free ticket to their preview performance because they wanted to also make sure that preview performance was full. So that was a benefit that I oh, God, they yeah. spoke yeah. really highly of. They were saying like that's how we got a full house on our preview night is that even if you just donated a dollar, yeah. you got to come to that. And, and let, me, let me tell you one thing, Just I know we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but your preview performance, pack it. Give it away for free. Yep. Pack it, Get because that is gonna generate buzz. And buzz is what's gonna sell out the rest of the run. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so speaking of ticketing, uh, what do you usually charge for tickets? And do you guys do discounts on tickets? What were some of some discounts that worked well for you? Can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, I, I, we, we've done, uh, when I talk about, uh, just talking about previews, we did a show for several years here called 25 Plays Per Hour, 25 short plays in 60 minutes, and it was a new slate of 25 plays every year. Uh, we would do 25 cents for the preview. So you come up, you pay a quarter, you get in. And it was, it was a great gimmick, because people were like, oh my god, such a deal, you know, 25 plays for 25 cents. Uh, but that was a great gimmick to get people in the door. We did a show called Sleeping Around last year, which was all about the sex lives of nine different people. We did 69 cent tickets for, for preview, you know, because you know, you know, we're all adults. Uh, but yeah, uh, that, that's the fun kind of gimmicks. I would say, I think the average ticket price is 12, 12.50. 12 dollars, yeah. We do, uh, we'll do normally 12 bucks online, uh, but we'll do, a, uh, we'll do a participant rate of $5. Because, let's be honest, some of the best people you're going to get to come and evangelicalize your show are other participants. So make it easy. I, we used to say pay what you want, but frankly there were a lot of pay what you want offers that came through that were zero dollar tickets. Where, you know, it, it was, comping is okay to a point, but God, it got rampant after a while. And there was just some abuses of that. So we think five dollars is a fair, modest price. Uh, for participants, so that's I, I think a fair going rate for that. And then, yeah, uh, on your postcards and on your posters and on all of your other marketing, put different discount codes for like two to five dollars off. 
uh, because this way you can track and see what your marketing is working or where your marketing is working to. You know, so we're doing four mini musicals. Use different character names. You know, from you know from the different show, from from your show. Use different character names, different concepts, different keywords, whatever. So this way, oh, this is my poster card uh, code, and that and I know that people are using that. People aren't using the business card one so much. You know, it's like where your marketing is working is important enough. Yeah. What I do every year is well for any show, um, I set up a, an Excel spreadsheet with all the, I set up my budget, I figure out how much I have to make in ticket sales to achieve my goal, whether that's breaking even or whether that's making some amount of money, it's different for different projects. And then you say, okay, so let's say I need to make, I need to make a thousand dollars from tickets. Okay, how can I do that at the number of seats in my house and the prices I want to charge? So I think, that, that budget's still up on the, mm -hmm. the website, right? I made a, like a template budget that's up on the Fringe website, which I think is in there, and if it's not, I'll make one. And it's up there, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think this formula is in it, yeah. and if it's, I'll check, and if it's not, I'll make a new one. I'm but, gonna tweet it. Great. Um, but basically what you do is you wanna figure out like how much room you have to play with. Like what, if, if I sell half the tickets at full price, that gets me this amount of money. Okay, then I need half, the other half of tickets to equal this amount of money, and it's all just algebra. And you s switch them all around, and you can figure out how much you have to play with. And then you do exactly what Greg said, and use discounts as ways to see if your cast is telling people about the show, see if your advertising is working. If you do want to do an ad, put a discount code in it. Like if you advertise in the LA Weekly, put like, use code LA Weekly for $2 off. It's tiny, but somebody will use it, and then you'll see if it worked, because why wouldn't they use it? So, I highly recommend algebra. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought we'd have to use that stuff again, right? Yeah, uh, it's high super school. important. It's high school people. Uh, uh, one thing I would say is, uh, and this uh, kind of goes to everything, uh, try to cram creativity in every nook and cranny you possibly can. Uh, our ticket price last year, uh, I, I think ten dollars is the fringe ticket price. I think anything over that, your people are going to go okay. Yeah, twelve bucks, fifteen bucks, twenty dollars. Your fringe shows twenty dollars, and they're okay. having those. All right, all right, because I can see three. You know, so uh, so <laughs> ten ten was what I wanted to charge, but for the post show, thirteen was funnier. <laughs> so, so 13 was what we charged. 13, spooky, was what we charged. Um, but I budgeted for 10. So I had $3 to throw away on each ticket. So, uh, so the discounts were generally 3 bucks to bring it down to 10. But th 13, spooky, stands out. The ticket price stands out. The venue was the... Can I say that? Of course. It was the asylum. <laughs> crazy. Like, it all <laughs> out, right? The post show. Spooky. Crazy. Like, it, it just happened to be that way. But find ways to line things up so that, uh, I'll probably hit this later, so that the premise of your show is supported by everything you do. Everything you do points to the premise of the show. Spooky. Post show. Crazy. Late night. Asylum. $13. It all points in the same direction. Um, see if you can fool with every every little element, every little detail that anybody's going to see on a postcard. Make it pop in their head so that it all lines up and it feels like an integrated thing. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of comp swaps, which is where you exchange tickets with other productions. And I, it, I agree with Greg. It got a little carried away, and it does eat into your profits. So I think if you're going to do that, which I would encourage, because it helps get French people in the door, is to just have a number of like how many should I give away? Because especially if you're in a small space, if you've comped like 12 tickets, that's a lot of your both your profit going into your recouping your budget, or just having seats available that you want to like withhold so that if you have seats you need to give away to press or industry people that you have some kept behind. So it's like, for us, we had 40 seats. We would usually sell out at 36 and save four that we would 
dole out if, it, if people needed them. But mm -hmm. I got into sort of like panic mode with my Google Docs spreadsheet. Everyone choose Google Docs, it's amazing. Um, not paid by Google. And um, I, got, I got freaked out because I gave away so many comps. I was so excited about getting people in to see the show that then those people, as I, will, I did the same thing, I would comp swap with people and then not go to the shows because I'm so exhausted. And then you're standing there and you've turned people away and then you've got two people that you gave a comp swap to that didn't show up that day. So yeah. I've, I've both done, been someone who did that and also experienced on receiving end. So just be aware of that when you're comp swapping. And I just want to throw in one, one thing about comping. Uh, there was a phenomenon that happened a couple of years ago. Uh, we had a whole brand new class of producers and a lot of the regulars that kind of sat out the year, kind of took a year off. And uh, one of the things is, guys, audiences in LA in general buy late, okay? A lot, a lot of them, so many of them will buy at the door. A lot of them will buy online at the last minute. Don't be freaked out if it's like the day before your performance and you only have a handful of seats sold. We've had that happen at, at Theater Unleashed and we've had a sold out house that night, you know? So what, what happened was we had a whole bunch of newbies uh, here at the Fringe who when they saw that they, they was like three days, four days out and they didn't have a house, they freaked out and started comping, like publicly comping, like free tickets to my show all over Twitter, free tickets to my show all over Facebook, all over the mailing list, all over the place. It was here, just come see my show, come see my show. And what that did was kill the market. Because anybody that was at, you know, everybody wanted to go to the free shows uh, and it devalued like the, the tickets for everybody else. Because there were those of us who were charging like the regular rates going like, oh yeah, I need to show up. Where suddenly, the nobody wanted to pay for a show, you know, and it really kind of hurt everybody's bottom line that year. That was that was a big phenomenon, and that's something to avoid. So be patient with buying the houses, and trust your promotion work, and trust everything else. And if you're out there and you're aggressive and you're talking to people, uh, don't resort to public comping because that doesn't just hurt your show; that hurts, that hurts everybody's. Yeah. Did you want to say something, Kat? And yeah. then we had to move on after this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. To okay. speak specifically to the question, uh, if you have a full musical with a live band, you can sell $15 tickets and you can sell out a run. Yeah. If you are a solo show or a smaller production or maybe you're just coming into town just for the fringe, you are going to want to give discounts. And I would say that, I think we've talked about it before, like 40%, thinking about filling 40% of your house with paying tickets at the price that's listed in the book is a good way to budget it, um, to break even. Very good tip, thank you. Yep. Um, all right, so marketing, tools, tips, tricks. Um, we talked about this a little bit already, but it's something that I know everybody is curious about. How do you make your show stand out? How do you, um, how do you decide what it looks like, what it feels like, all these things? What do you guys do for marketing? Uh. Well, when we did Sleeping Around, we did our postcard with everybody in their underwear. Uh, and then we had trading cards of each individual cast member with a discount code on it that we handed out. And we had an online uh, game going where if you could collect all the postcards, or if you could collect all the trading cards, you got a prize. Uh, I don't even remember what the prize was. It was a drink at Fringe Central. Oh yeah, we, we, bought, we, we took you drinking with us at Fringe Central. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, that was expensive. <laughs> um, but then uh, we also had an online game where uh, if you could tweet a picture of you, uh, uh, everybody was in a seductive pose in their underwear uh, on the postcard. And uh, I was the trashiest of them all. I just had my pants around my ankles. Uh, That's pretty trash. Yeah, well, the rest of it, but yeah. Uh, we, uh, if you could recreate that and post it on Instagram, uh, we had a prize for that as well, for, for like the best recreation. And, and there was a guy who literally dropped his pants around his ankles and was standing at Santa Monica Boulevard in his underwear next to, next to my poster, or next to my, you know, next to me on the poster. Uh, and that, that went viral for a hot minute, so that was fun. Uh, you know, so it's, it's like having that kind of fun gimmick uh, and making it relate to your show. The other thing is, is one of the best bits of buzz and word of mouth is patron reviews. Get your patron reviews. I, I would say the patron reviews are, can be even better press than the uh, than actual re regular reviews. Um, what we do uh, at the end of what we, we we've done, we actually stole this from um, the guys who did Bronies a couple of years ago. When we left their show, they handed out a piece of candy and a piece of paper attached to it that said, "If you enjoyed the show, please re leave a review," and it had their link. What we did 
is we took that a step further. Instead of using candy, we used show buttons. So people could actually put the button, our logo for, their, for our show, on their clothes, wear it around fringe, and they still got the tag saying, hey, leave a review here. And Jeremy Aluma, who runs Four Clowns, is a freaking machine when it comes to getting patron reviews. But we have consistently, <laughs> ever since we've done this, we've been consistently either number two or number three in most patron reviews on productions. So this works. And that kind of buzz, uh, when people go and read the patron reviews and go, oh my god, I love the show, that translates to, to ticket sales. So patron reviews are a very good tool to use. Cool. I'll give you a piece of advice that doesn't cost anything. Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to tweet it. Yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> this is important if you're a, a solo show solo producer, but it's especially important if you're working with an ensemble um, that you have a, a clear way of talking about your show. This is, you need to have an elevator pitch for your show. And it needs to be readily understandable. It's, it's great if it's sometimes a little mysterious, if that works, like the, the post-show stuff all kind of fit together. Spooky. Spooky. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, like for Hamlin Mobile, it's like, we're doing Hamlin in a van. Uh. It's like, well, okay, tell me more. Yeah. Um, but if every, you should kind of rehearse it with everybody on your team so that everybody that you've pulled in on your project, that you are, are basically going out and sending out as your delegates into the fringe, that it's a unified message. That they're not like, yeah, it's kind of this thing, it's kind of weird, but yeah, I love that, I love that. You want them to be a good ambassador of the show. And you gotta give them the tools to do that. So I, what I do for all of my shows is I, I send an email to all the cast and crew that has, here are all the ways that you can help make this show great. Because you've got to always remind them, it's, oh, it's not about money, it's not about selling tickets. Shows are better when they're full. It's just better, it's more fun. So give them options. It's like, if you've got 20 minutes today, write three personal emails to people you know and tell them about the show. If you've got five minutes, go post on Facebook. If you've got two minutes, text a friend. If you've got an hour, go take some postcards to Fringe Central. Go have a drink at Fringe Central. All that kind of stuff. And then include the language to describe your show. Make it as easy as possible. Make it easy on them. Mm. And they'll do it if you've made it easy yeah. for them. How long is an elevator pitch? Two sentences. OK. Maybe three. Okay. There's a really good TED Radio Hour that they just released on March 4th, I think, and it's about how ideas spread. And if you're looking for inspiration, there's a lot of different opinions on that podcast about what makes an idea go viral and how, how things do spread within our human culture. Uh, TED Radio Hour, how ideas spread. Uh, one thing I would say is um, don't use stuff you, you don't know don't just start up a well, let's say the crowdfunding. Like, don't just do a crowdfunding thing if if that's you, everybody's doing that. Or you think that should happen? Um, I wasn't uh, tweeting last year for the post show because I don't really tweet. Um, 140 characters is a little restrictive for me. <laughs> um, but um, no smoking uh, Sorry. <laughs> But my producer, uh, he basically gave me permission to tweet as Poe. And what that allowed me to do was bring the show live every day, all the time, on Twitter. So I came up with a basic Twitter joke, which is, thank you for following me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you'll just leave me alone, I'll, you know, Poe, follow, Poe, follow. And, and it went, you know, thank you for following me to the graveyard. You want to make out? You know, like that. <laughs> um, and it was kind of a pain to continually come up with, you know, jokes like that. But that was my job. That was my publicity job, to write material for the publicity thing. But it was integrated to the show. So that voice was in people's heads when they sh came to the... To the, and I'm not Poe. I don't, I don't play Poe. Another guy plays Poe. Brendan Hunt played Poe. But, uh, but I wrote Poe. It's, it's weird. Anyway, Poe lives here. It's neither of us. It's, uh, it's neither of you. It's both of you. It's, that's right. Yeah. It's all of us. Isn't it? Um, and then we wake up and realize we're in the Matrix the whole time. It's, I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it. But 
finding a way to, to make whatever medium you're working with integrated to your show. Again, supporting the premise of your show so that maybe you don't have a Facebook thing going on, maybe you don't have a Twitter thing going on, but the Instagram thing you got going on is something that's like, have you seen, have you seen Hamlet Mobile's Instagram? It doesn't make any sense. I, you gotta get on there, it's awesome. If you guys wanna look at some great Instagrams, uh, check out Alien vs. Musical from last year, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Those guys, had, their Instagram, Instagram game was strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's, yes. uh, and it's probably worth your time to kind of go through the site and peruse like what other people have done. Mm -hmm. Go back and see what the, the shows that uh, were successful last year, um, what they did. Uh, I know um, uh, uh, Time, Heart. Time Heart had these huge posters that looked like movie posters. It was, it was like a sci-fi, and you look at it and you're like, it's a professional production here, a Broadway yeah. style. Yeah. <laughs> and I, they told me how they came about and how they came about to do it because it looked like a thousand dollar poster. That kind of stuff really does stand out because it was the only one like that. Um, everybody else will get like a a big poster, but this was this was their image, and it was everywhere, mm. and uh, and they did it very well in a really big room. Did y'all sell out? They had the Lillian. The Lillian, one yeah. of the yeah. biggest rooms. And and I think that poster just, people are used to going, oh, it looked like the Star Wars poster. It's like, I know what that is. I'm going to go see that show. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's supported. So again, integration and supporting the prints. And your postcard was bigger than most too, right? Yeah. So you went the opposite route with the card, because yeah. 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 you knew you had this image, well, right? Well, we thought people would actually want to save it. It was that. Yeah. And how did you guys get this amazing poster? Do you want to talk about that? That was uh, because one of our dear friends, Andy, had um, been working on the Cosmos, the show with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and one of the artists on that show had also been doing the art for Argo. Uh, they were friends, and he asked him if he would do a discounted commission, and we paid part of it, and then Andy was an angel investor and paid for the rest of it. So. It definitely was a big investment, that's right. uh, but it paid off, so that's good. I can't wait to see what we make for Thug Tunnel. Um, <laughs> it's going to be more 80s Thug style. Tunnel. Yeah. Thug yeah. Tunnel. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I would say in terms of so social media, sure. okay. Please. Uh, I would like know, know the purpose of each platform. It's like for us, uh, Facebook was mostly about news and Talk to someone about how to set up a Facebook event where the date changes. Mm -hmm. I did not do it right, and then you get locked out, and then you have to, it, it doesn't, like, like it's bad. very it's confusing. Bad. And you yeah. would think that it's simple because we've been making Facebook invites since they like college parties. Right, yeah. It's different now, and it, especially if you have an event that has multiple nights, like just before you invite everyone, make sure you've done it right because we messed it up last year and it, like mm -hmm. I had to cancel the event, and then people who were. Like industry people are like, oh, did your thing get canceled? Like, no, I had to change the time. It, it's uh, super confusing. Yeah. Um, for us, so for us, and uh, there's also an app called Over, which you can download, and it puts text over your Instagrams. It's like a dollar ninety nine in the App Store, and it helped us. We were very similar to the post show, where our social media on Instagram and Twitter was about a tone that matched the show. So I was writing tweets as Max and Elsa tweeting at each other, which. Mm -hmm. it, it was mostly so just like, about continuing the vibe. Um, it wasn't really, I didn't think like someone would see that and be like, it was never information about our play. It was always just like a different narrative where they're tweeting about what they were doing. And then Instagram. In conversation. In conversation, just tweeting at each other. Sometimes they would tweet other people, but it was like very esoteric and just the two of them mostly talking about like their plans for the weekend. Uh, <laughs> but it was to get across the vibe and the tone of our show. And then for Instagram, we, had production photos that I highly recommend, like in your preview or dress rehearsal, have a show where you run through it in costume and have some with the camera, because we had all these great production images that then we used with text, and it was it always had an attitude and an edge towards it about when we would sell out a show, and making it news oriented so that, in terms of how often you post, it was never like, here's just a thing. For Facebook and Instagram, it was like, this is news, this is a new piece of information you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Like, we sold out this run, we've added a new show, so that people feel like when they engage with it, they're like, oh, I didn't know that. As opposed to just, you're, you're flooding my feed with images that are just images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, as with anything else, the more time and effort you put into something, the more interesting it is to the person who then sees it, right? So a lot of, I think there's a lot of temptation to cross post. We do a little bit of that actually from the fringe, where we do, we do publish all of our Instagram posts also to our Twitter timeline. Um, and so sometimes we'll double up on messages there, but it's a good idea to think about which avenues deliver which information the best. And also you don't have to do all of them. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of, some people are like, oh God, do I have to do, I have to do an Instagram? No. No, um, do what you want to do. I would say Twitter is pretty, pretty solid. Yeah, Twitter's Twitter. Twitter's a big deal at the fringe. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. To Twitter was the only way you could find out where Hamlet Mobile was it's going true. to be. It's yeah. true. We oh, had a very yeah. special that relationship really with Twitter cool. last week. Uh, but you can learn on it too. You don't have to engage. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Instagram is just a great way to like. I think the, if you're not a Photoshop whiz, it's a great way to create image assets that look more professional than yeah. yours would be. So like, I was posting on my personal Instagram, but again, doubling up by tweeting those same images and sometimes putting adding into our Facebook event, but it's really more about what the look of it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you guys, uh, besides Kat, how did you guys find the people who designed the images for your marketing campaigns? Do you use photos? Do you use like drawing? Like what do you use? We, the director that I work with and I both share a real love of collage aesthetics and most of the things that we do together, the imagery for the show tends to be collage based. Um, and we have a graphic designer who's um, like a childhood friend of her husband and has done graphic design stuff for us for years. But um, we just, we're doing a show right now and um, had kind of a, a novice friend who's just kind of interested in collages make one for us. Um, and she actually, it was kind of a cool process. Uh, she basically did Photoshop layers, but in real life uh, with transparency paper. So she made all these different transparencies and then scanned them and then I went in on Photoshop and I layered them and tweaked the colors and stuff. So this one was more of a team effort. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, you can, you can do it yourself if you have somebody with an eye toward design and specifically with the ability to use like Photoshop or um, InDesign, that's really helpful. Um, if you can try to find that person who can who can like format it all for you if you've got the vision mm -hmm. and make it for a postcard and for a right. Twitter header and for an event yeah photo exactly. and all the different dimensions that you might need because it's not only for a poster exactly which which if you know how to use those programs you know that's not too hard to do but to do it without having any knowledge is very difficult <laughs> uh, and, and find find that person right now. Find those specific those people that are going to be doing something very specific for you, something very tech based or very skills based. Find them now because uh, just like venues, it's great that most of you have already got yours. As as you get closer, those people are going to become busier and busier and busier busier because uh, there there are not that many who like the um, like like the I go back to the. Uh, time hard poster by how do you find how do you find that guy how do you find that deal right or someone who's a whiz at uh, you know whatever uh, whatever the the technology you're going to use find them now because you don't want to be scrambling for those key pieces of your marketing campaign two weeks before your show you want that stuff ready to go you want to be able to look at it proof it say no have time to send it back get another rent whatever. Uh, the main thing is the more you front load the pain, the more you do it now, do the hard work right now, the pain. then <laughs> while, yeah, I mean, that's... Well, you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. Do it now. Pretend you're already behind. Uh, look at a man sitting in front of you talking who is, in fact, already behind. Uh, and, and, and run that way. And then when opening night comes, all you got to do is the show. Because if you do it now, then you're not scrambling around looking for that perfect image that's going to be the thing. You're, you've already thought this stuff through. It's sort of like the, the Hitchcock. He already, he'd already seen the movie three times before they made it. Because he, he drew it, and he storyboarded it, and he thought, like, it's all, have it all done. Uh, it's still fairly early, but um, 
get on all that stuff right now, like to, tonight, like <laughs> make your list and start knocking those people out. No pressure, guys. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and move through the next two quickly, so you guys can too, and then we have time for Q and A. Um, we already talked about the importance of the peer review situation on the fringe site, so we don't need to talk about that anymore. We all unanimously agree that we like it, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. support other people doing it. Like when you see a show, write them a review. Write a there review. You go. Yes, please write a review. Um, other publicity? Do you guys want to talk about that at all? Is it worth hiring a publicist? Is it worth like going out for who should who? I write I, I show? would suggest that if you don't know how to write a proper press release. Get somebody that knows how to do it. Um, may I make a quick plug? Uh, Theater and Leash has a resident publicist who uh, who does freelance for the Fringe. Uh, his name is Jim Martica. Uh, it's 200 bucks for him to write your press release and help you format it and everything, but distribution of it is on you. But he's a great resource. Uh, he's done a lot of publicity for Fringe guys before. Um, and this is not a paid endorsement of, of Jim, he's, uh, but he is a good friend of mine. But he does a lot of great work and he can help you out. If you want his contact information, you can see me afterwards. Depends on your goals, I would say. Um, if you just want to try something out and put something up and get feedback from your peers, I think then you can relax a little bit about pushing your press release out and bugging people to come and see it and spend more time building those relationships with like-minded peers that you think you'd want to collaborate with in the future or might want to be involved in your show if you remount it or whatever. Um, if you are trying to like make a bunch of money, then you're going to want to be more invested in getting out there and selling tickets and being present than if you're just trying to get reviews and like get your play published down the line, then you're gonna wanna, you know, find the actual people still writing about theater in LA. And it's that's important. I've had two plays that I brought to Fringe that have gotten published and the, the, the publicity I got from the fringe was absolutely crucial in making that happen. Mm -hmm. So But manage your expectations about who you can get to come as a first time producer was very gung-ho about reaching out to everyone from every press list I could get, and I heard back from nobody. So just know that if you, if this is your first time producing a show, it's a new company, just be okay knowing that if you start to sell tickets and there's buzz, we had all of the reviewers contact us after the show had already started, and we just wanted reviews because it's great to get a review, um, but it just manage your expectations about, like. Yeah, the, time, the times ain't going to come to your show. Which I emailed twice, and no, they did not. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's fun to email, but they're, yeah. uh, again, also remember, there are like, how many shows at the French? Hundreds. Hundreds. Ev so oh, everyone is emailing the same people to come see the show, so know that it, you are a drop in the bucket of like hundreds of emails that they're getting around to. And you're going to get probably what's called like a capsule review. It's going to be a shorter review than you would get if you just, you know, produced a show in the middle of February and hired a publicist. So think yeah. about the... Even the return on your investment that you get, it's just not as many words, if that's important mm -hmm. to you. Um, yeah, they'll be little. Uh, and it's oh. time consuming, and I'm going yeah. to now move into the next topic. <laughs> Don't pay for reviews, though. No. Don't spend money for reviews. Uh, <laughs> time management. So we're going to talk about, uh, briefly about time management, which I'm doing a semi-okay job at. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I, I'm sure, we're getting a lot of information here about how you have to do kind of 100 things during the festival. So. Um, tell me uh, the number one, like most important thing for you to spend your time on, and how do you manage your sanity when wearing all these I would, hats? I would say the absolute number one thing when it comes to time management is delegation. Don't try to do it all yourself. <laughs> First of all, you're not good at everything. Uh, you know people who are better at things than you are? Enroll them. They might not care about your show, they might not care about theater, they might not care about anything, but maybe they're great at budgets, maybe they're great at, uh, I don't know, publicity, whatever. Uh, expand your team uh, to people who are good at stuff. And then you don't have to worry about it. The worst thing to do is to have to worry about something that you have to do that you don't have any idea uh, how to do it. Find people who are good at it and have them do it. Uh, that is, in my opinion, the number one time-saving tip because then you can go back to doing what you're good at. Uh, and you'll get a much better result, and you don't carry as much burden on your shoulders. Yeah, the thing I, to, how, how many people are, are producing and or directing and or in their show and or have written their show? Yeah. 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 You yeah, pick like, like now the best thing to do would be once you get to like May 15th to pick one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know that's not realistic, Dealing. but pick two. Yeah. Realistically, because that's like all your body can actually do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the shows that tend to do 
really well are the ones that have have enough help. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We're a couple months out. You can get your calendar out and you can designate, okay, this is the day when I have my press releases ready and I send them out and that's eight weeks in advance of the thing. So if you follow up three weeks later, that's also on your calendar. Your set is all built by the end of April. You're running the show all of May. You know, like as much as you can block out now. So if you have a little time to think ahead, and start developing those materials that you'd need down the line. Like now you're at a great place and you're already ahead of the game being here, learning as much as you can. So write out that list, try to plot every day and then stick to those dates as, as well as you can. Yep. Off of what Monica said, wearing multiple hats, if you are writing your show, like my co-producer was also my co-writer and we were very specific like the script is going to be done before we start rehearsing and it was and I got and I got to tell you being able to take off our we did our Kickstarter while we were writing taking off our writing hats and be like we are in producing and she was our set designer graphic designer I was the composer and the director but we were in production mode the script was done we cut like seven pages through the rehearsal process, but having the script done made it so that we could focus on the actual production because there's nothing worse for actors when you are handing them new pages that they're gonna have to memorize in a way that is not organized. Like obviously if you're doing new work, it's going to be rewritten and tested during the rehearsal process, but if you can have a script that is done once you start, you will save yourself so much emotional or heart like headache and heartache because it is there's too much to worry about if you're also like, well, what about the script? Because that's where the show starts. And if it's not done, then it's hard to come up with a marketing plan or you know, yeah. all that stuff. And ultimately, you want to, like, nothing's going to be better for you at the fringe than having a good show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah like, that, that should be your first sure you priority. Protect yeah. your, your creative space so your, you have enough time for it. Your, your first priority and your best marketing is having a quality show. Yeah. Okay, that has got to be your number one priority. Everything else, everything else can go to hell, but if the show is good, there will be word of mouth. And you can you can bank on that. You got to bring you got to bring a quality experience. Uh, I would also say, leading up, uh, guys, all hell's gonna break loose multiple times throughout this entire process. The one thing, <laughs> I, it just just be ready for it. Okay, it, 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 shit's gonna come at you from every angle. You're never gonna see it coming. It's always gonna be the unexpected. Be be patient. Be rested. Make sure you take the time to to rest and actually take a little time away in your process leading up to everything. Because there'll be no sleep in June. Make sure you're, 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 you're eating and you're resting and, you're, and everything. Because the other thing is when you're dealing with all these problems and all these left field things, they always seem 100 times worse if you're exhausted or if you're already stressed out. So if you, can, if you keep yourself in a healthy mental and physical place throughout this process, everything is just so much more manageable. Yeah, I pack snacks during the fringe. Snacks are important. Nothing more than angry. Yeah, um, and I'll give I'll give kind of one other I'll, I will give two two tips and then we'll open it up for Q and A if, if I may. Um, one thing I would say is when you're looking to build your team, right? Like creating your team, and if you're thinking like who do I know who's really good at social media, and you don't you can't think of anybody. If you do have a friend who is just like who like loves you and is into what you're doing and like making your art, and it's like if you want me to help, let me know. Ha have them try it. Like maybe they, they are not great at Twitter, but be like, would you want to work on this? Like, would you want to, would you be willing to help me with this? And like, you can learn everything on Google and YouTube right now. Um, and coming from the place of the festival staff, we, like when I started working for the French Festival, I didn't know anything about running a festival, but I like was into the idea and I worked pretty hard and they were like, well, figure out how to, do, how to do this. And so um, I'm still figuring out how to do this, but it is something that like, if you have someone who wants to be on your team, but you don't know what they can do, like find something, like they'll, they'll figure it out and then, you, and then your team is bigger. The, um, the one place where I disagree with you on that yeah. is, if, don't just let your best friend who's never been inside a theater before ever be your stage manager. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not joking, That's guys, seriously. Poor Larry, hire a stage manager. Hire, hire a stage manager. If there's yeah. one thing that you want to spend money on, Get a stage manager. Now, a lot of the spaces will come with a stage manager and board up, but having somebody that you can have in rehearsals that knows the show inside and out, that can yeah. interface with the space and, and be that kind of firewall, that, that is crucial. You don't want to have someone who doesn't, who's never seen the inside of a theater be your SM. That is too important a job. Yeah. Uh, so spend the money. If you, if you don't know stage managers, there is a LA Stage Managers Facebook group. You get in there, you talk to people, uh, they're going to want a little bit of cash. Couple hundred bucks, whatever. But you know what? It's worth its weight in yes. gold. Okay. I just yeah. Yeah. Good tip. Yeah. Within reason, you can learn anything on 
Yes, there, there are a couple. I wouldn't like get in a plane with a friend who was like, I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done this before, but I stayed at yeah. Holiday Inn Express last night. Yeah, and the second, the second thing is that this is a, the nice thing about this festival, one of many, is that this is set up as like a win 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 sort of situation. If your show does well, your venue does well. If your venue does well, your festival does well. We really are in it to support each other. So there will be times when you get really stressed or you're, you know, you feel like you can't do it or you don't know what to do or the shit hits the fan. Um, and there are lots of fans. Reach, reach, out to, reach out and ask for help or advice. If you're not sure, like, is this, some, is this crazy? Should this be happening? Should I be feeling this way? You can email us at support. Um, you can tweet to us. You can, like, catch us after a thing and say, like, is it weird that this is happening or crazy? You know, and, like, we will be there. We've been through and seen almost all of it. So um, it's a win-win-win. Nobody, nobody here does well if we don't all do well. No left, nice. no show left. Yeah. So thank you, guys. And let's open up for a, a bit of Q&A. Um, if you can raise your hands, and we'll try and make this quick so that we can move through and get out of here promptly on time. Okay, so right over here. And please say your name and then your question to everyone here. Hi, I'm Philip Morris. Uh, my question is, uh, my show um, includes actors consuming alcohol on stage, which obviously is a big issue with insurance. Oh, and uh, the venue we'd be looking for would be someone which has a bar quite prominently. Um, what would be the best way to approach that, do you think? I would talk to your venue first to, to just be point blank with them and ask um, because, yeah, it, a lot of times with insurance questions, it's like, how much risk are you willing to accept, you know, and that's, you just have to decide. But sure, I mean, they probably can advise if the insurance isn't included in your rental package. I'm um, not sure, it's still finding venues. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Three clubs Three or clubs. Dragonfly are bars. Yeah. 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 yeah, there you go. I forgot Dragonfly's taking shows too, you guys should check Yeah. Um, I wonder if anybody has ever done an out of town tryout with a fringe show. Done a show before they did their preview show somewhere outside of the fringe. I did that. I did that year one. Um, I did that because I realized that I backloaded all of my performances at the very end of the festival and nobody was, and we had no momentum by the time we opened. So I did a one night invite only press night up at our space in North Hollywood, and uh, it helped. It got us some pull quotes and some buzz before we opened, and it actually got us some ticket sales. So. Uh, Les Kirkendall is a fellow Fringer, uh -huh. and he um, goes to the Rogue Festival in Fresno periodically. And, and he just got back home. Okay. There you go. Yep. And he kind of starts a show there and then works through the Fringe circuit. You might find him on the Fringe site. Okay, I guess the question I'm asking is, um, is there a place to rehearse it, or has anybody had a place to rehearse a show before they get it into the fringe? Oh, uh, here in town, sort of. A yeah, all my shows uh, started at, as serial killers at, at Sacred Fools, which is a, a late night mm -hmm. open, submit, get accepted. I think UCB has things like that. Okay. There, there are stages around town that are sort of these open, some are competitions, some are open, not open mic, but open stage type situations. Yeah, um, yeah there, there, there's actually a lot uh, going on that way. You have to find them, mm -hmm. but um, everything, I've, everything I've brought to the fringe was tested. Okay. You also can and maybe should uh, rent a space and do a table read with people you respect that would give you yeah. feedback if you're feeling like you want that before you go into rehearsals. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Greta from The Rum Show. Um, question about Fringe Central. Is that like around the clock? Is there times that you found are more a better to go than others? Like if you're using it as a promotion networking thing? Office hours. So it's great. That's before Fringe Central opens. Mm -hmm. And then around the clock. So there might be four people there, but you could make friends with those four people and that could be very powerful for you. So anytime, yeah. just dropping in anytime as often as possible is encouraged. The official hours I don't think are posted yet, but we're open on like weeknights, six, it's six on. It's yeah, bar, bar hours. hours. Yeah, but yeah. On the weekends, we will publish the hours yeah. soon. Weekends we open earlier, bar hour. um, like we're open more in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would say that the feedback people had about the office hours last year was really great. So it was, it was like an every Wednesday bar mixer and it was nice because when you got to that first step like that first day at Friend Central you already knew 
20 or 30 people, and, mm -hmm. and people did really like that. So you already had like your buddy. And if, yeah. if you have a team just covered in shifts, like my producer and I would like trade off nights sometimes, really like, uh, just so that you don't burn out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. burnout's we'll a very real oh, yeah. Monday night in Fringe Central isn't the most swinging. Right. Uh, but, but again, yeah, if there are four people there, those are four people who are you. Right. you and you can have a nice, intimate conversation, and sometimes that's an even better sales pitch yeah. than, than, hey, see my show, thanks, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Every Wednesday, 7 p.m., different bars around town, and they are published right now on the Fringe blog. The first one is at Three Clubs next, on Wednesday, March 30th. Show of hands. Right back there? For what? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was you were in. <laughs> I, have, I have two questions. Regarding equity, what is your standing with them? Can we use equity actors or not? And also, regarding previews, is the cost different for a preview than normal? And if so, what's the advantage of doing a preview? Sure. As far as equity goes, um, we have a wonderful relationship with equity, but it is different depending on what your relationship or the relationship of, of those actors is. So you need to ask your rep. We can't speak to that, what the rules are for using their. Every show yeah. has their own relationship with equity. Yeah. So right. you are just as you would have it during the rest of the year. Gotcha. Yeah. There, there are several. Uh, Putting my hat on as a member of the Producers League of Los Angeles, uh, there, there are. Uh, it used to be that it was just a 99 seat plant, and that was the easy way to go about doing things. Uh, those waters are obviously very muddied right now with the ongoing situation. Um, but you need to talk to your yeah, equity you gotta ask. rep. That's the answer. Yeah, yeah. That's the talk answer. to equity about for equity. time. For time, can we move yeah. on oh, to yeah. the next I'm one? Sorry. So the other question was: Is the preview cheaper, and what's the benefit of doing it? Yes, cheaper. Yes. What's the advantage of the preview. Word of mouth is, uh, you know, we, we always stacked, we, we made we basically made our previews free and stacked them uh, for word of mouth. The word of mouth would generate sellouts all down the rest of the run. Uh, we would also invite as press and, and theater bloggers, not just traditional press, but bloggers there to do uh, to come in and get early reviews. So we would do one preview, uh, stack it, and then uh, use that buzz that came from that after the festival opened to, to pack the rest of the houses. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. It's basically the big bang at the top that you want to ripple, ripple yeah. through the rest of the... Uh, Can't underestimate how important it is to pack that preview. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, right back there, center, yes. I have two really quick questions. I'm Tara from Rodsburg Theater. We used Fringe last year to launch our company and it did great things for us and have a our show, so Sweet. we're looking to come back this year. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I know some of you do specific social media handles for the show and some of you use your theater. What do you recommend as far as that? And then my second question is more personal aside from Rod. I've been producing for 10 years. Last year was my first fringe. And I felt so blindsided getting into it, trying to run it like I would run a normal production. Yeah. Um, and I still feel like there's more to learn, which is why I'm here. Uh, so if you guys have a little advice for a seasoned producer and how to, what sort of mindsets need to change to make the fringe more successful for yourself. Well, speaking to the the social media handle question, um, because I'm now mired in that place where we we launched our company last year with Hamlet Mobile, like you guys, and we used Hamlet Mobile as the Twitter handle, and Twitter was so tied into the show because that was the only way you could find out where the van was parked. Um, Great move. Great. But so now we want to transition to being capital W, which is our production jingle, and we're like our Instagram is under capital W, and our Twitter is still under Hamlet Mobile. So if you're establishing things, my opinion is to do it under the company name from the get go, because you're going to have you just set yourself up for easier times later. You don't, don't do what I did. I, <laughs> I, I've used both. Theater Unleashed has a pretty strong social media presence, and we, we tweet primarily from that. But for certain projects, like my plays Friends Like These and Super Sidekick the Musical, which I brought here, we also had individual social media accounts for the shows themselves because they were designed to have a life beyond the festival. And now I use those outlets that I developed uh, during the festival to promote the shows now that they've been published. and. Uh, People respond to the social media stuff, and I get licensed productions, you know, because of the social media presence. So it, it depends on, I guess, what the end result is that you want for your project. Mm -hmm. Producing year-round versus producing at Fringe. What's the biggest difference? Mm -hmm. 
No idea. I just do the fringe. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I, I actually find producing a fringe easier because of the there's so many more people around. That it's kind of like yeah. Yeah. I think that's a longer conversation. I take yeah. you out for a drink and chat with you about that. Okay. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Hands up for questions in the green. Um, this is going to sound like a terrible question. It doesn't mean to be, but um, can somebody speak to outside of equity? Um, I guess how one goes about paying actors during fringe. I don't know if people do. We produced our play once, but like we cast all our friends, and they did it for us as a favor, and like. We're gonna have to cast new people again. And I, I hate being the person that posts like, I want you to be in my show, but also I can't pay you. Like, and I don't, I don't really know what the ethics on that are in Fringe, or if people have ever like paid actors afterwards, depending on what they made. Uh, I don't you, know. you can budget to pay your actors. Yeah. 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 A stipend, you know. I mean, if if it's important to pay your actors, then that's that's a budget. I mean, that's part of the. That's part of what you you build into the to the front. Mm -hmm. uh, you might not be able to guarantee them a certain amount, or maybe you do. And that um, we uh, I was adamant last year that I was going to pay all my actors for all their performances because I was done with people giving things away. Uh, especially in this, where we're able to control everything. Well, the reason we give away things out there is because somebody bigger than us is telling us that's the only way we're going to get through a door. Well, that's not what we can do. We can create what we want. So if you want to pay your actors, budget to pay your actors, and then your ticket price and your number of shows and the venue, and it all falls under that. Um, you're not going to pay people 30 bucks a show because that's not economically Definitely, feasible. Yeah. But, but a you know. stipend so they can afford to go drink at the yeah. bar, so they can afford to take off work to yeah. hang out during the festival is, is I think, very ethically sound. And, you know, there are also other models where uh, I know shows that have done box office splits with, with the cast, you know, when the, when the cast is also everything else involved in the show and it's a very self-contained thing. Box office splits aren't unheard of. Uh, one, uh, one show that was affiliated with TU a couple of years ago, uh, the, the pr lead producer on that said, uh, anybody who drops your name at the box office, I'll give you half the ticket. You know, so it's it, it it was based on how many people they could get in the house. You know, so that that was another model where yeah, a couple of some people and it was a ninety seat house, so some people were walking away with some padded pockets after that. Did you have something? Yeah, we did. Um, I agree that for me it was just uh, I was all the cast were friends and including all the production team, so we had something where anyone who was at the show after a stage manager had a set fee per night and it was it's mostly like a token it's not a lot but then because we raised money up front we ended up with a profit and then i was like very specific about sort of first in last out where i paid out people proportional from the proceeds based on what kind of work that they did and so that i didn't tell the caster crew about that though and i kept it a secret and when they i told them that they were getting a check after the show they were thrilled so it was, for me, it was like a, it was a, a special thank you, but I was very, I, I think paying people however much you can within your budget just helps people with like the, the ethics of like, or even the work ethic of like, I'm gonna show up on time because I know I'm getting X amount of money for my. Yeah. Okay, next, oh, sorry, I gotta move on, okay. Yeah. You well, want to last year we didn't charge anything for tickets and nobody got paid. So, I mean, but everybody knew that. I think the only thing that strikes me as truly, truly wrong is if you tell people they'll be paid and then you don't. Yeah. That's the one you cannot do. You're clear with the expectations up front. Yeah. Very good. Yep, go ahead. Question? Yep. Yeah, um, I'm Lori Goldberg in a solo show called Snatch the Rice Down There. <laughs> <laughs> Stage Raw makes an effort to get out and cover a lot of the fringe. Um, they're they're a big one. Uh, LA Weekly has been increasing their their coverage of the LA theater scene again, uh, bit by bit. Um, you can research the articles that were written last year and yeah. then re find the authors of it and get their contact. Information. Yeah, actually, and you know what the best place to do that is is uh, Bitter Lemons. If you go to Bitter Lemons and just look at who's writing the professional reviews, you can uh, especially for I did a I. Uh, produced a comic book musical a couple of years ago, and I went on Bitter Lemons and looked at everybody that had gone and reviewed other geek-related musicals, 
and contacted all of them. So find something similar to that and uh, make your press list that way. All right, next question. Stripes? Um, is it, am I wearing stripes? Sorry, my name is Lisa. Um, I'm doing a solo show. Um, quick question about the ads in the fringe program or yeah. you can get, did you guys find a return on it? Is it totally worth it to do? Because I know there's so many different ways you can market. So I did budget it in to like my Kickstarter thing when I'm raising money, so I have it to spend. But if I can put it into something else, I will. So I just want to know, have you seen a return? Does it make a difference having your art in the program? I would assume it does. But I think that's the best place in terms of print that you would want to invest would be in the program because everyone's going to pick one up and everyone's going to leave through it and walk through it. So I think that's a wise budget. Yeah. Yeah. And also impression, they get the online ads on the fringe site because the fringe website gets thousands, hundreds of thousands of hits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty cheap. That's a pretty good yeah, they discounted once you, because I went to a town hall and they said they're discounted once you register with Fringe. Is that yep. true? Yep. Yeah, Dave's it's not. true. Dave's okay. they're, they're half price. Uh, all the print ads uh, and the impressions are half price uh, once you're officially registered. And bear in mind that you need to be logged in with the account that actually owns the registered yeah. show when you buy the ad. Okay. But don't fret either if you're registered and you buy the ad. Uh, Incorrectly, we will we'll fix it. sort it out. <laughs> Support at HollywoodFrench.org. Um, next question. Okay, can you guys who have questions keep your hands up too? Because I'm going to try and burn through these really fast. So we're going to do right back there. Go. Your question. your time slots yet with no. your venue? No. I'm just speaking for myself as a frequent fringe audience member. Uh, I tend to not like to go to dramas late at night. I think picking your time slots strategically might be more important than with a, a musical comedy, which like kind of anything goes anytime soon. I would say whatever genre, just brainstorm mm -hmm. all the people that might be interested. So if it's a drama about childbirth, then you're going to find midwife organizations and market to them. You know, like whatever, follow the rabbit hole and make a big list of people that might be interested in that topic. Um, drama. And there's other going to end. And find other dramas. There, there are people who love to laugh and to cry just as much as they love to laugh. So yeah, yeah. Good dramas don't laugh. Yeah. But I would partner with other dramas too. You can find Fringe friends that will also do a shout out or put your postcard in their program during the Fringe or whatever. Yeah, to help. the marketing alliances are really big. Thank you. Right here. Okay, fast. When you're doing the discount um, codes for tickets, do you do that with the website for the Fringe Fest or do you do it for the website for your venue or do you make a whole nother website? Ticket sales are all handled via the HollywoodFringe.org website, and that's where you make those specific codes. You should also invest maybe in a PayPal, Square, whatever it is, and have an iPad or a cell phone that you can sell tickets at the door, and you can also implement yeah. codes, discount codes at the door using the automated ticketing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But mostly through the website. Yeah, do it on the Fringe site. If you want someone to help walk you through those steps, it is on the site, but you can also email us at support. Um, I can also show, I think probably, show you on my phone after this if you want how to set up a discount code for a ticket. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty easy. It's in your admin tab when you create your project and it's like you can make an infinity of them and yeah. you just type in what the word is and what the discount is and it's and then it exists. It's really flexible. It's really easy. Really, easy. really, really great yeah. system. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right here? Go Ben. Um, is there a world that exists where uh, shows cross promote each other? Absolutely. Absolutely. If there is, what's the proper etiquette for it? Uh, great question. I would, I would say first of all get to know the shows in your venue. Uh, a lot of venues do it automatically. They'll They'll cross promote in the programs, but uh, we always had you know, in your program. You have four other shows, or you know, also in this venue. Um, but yeah, at the end, uh, at the end of shows, people will give shout outs to other shows. Uh, it's just relationships. It's just you develop relationships with shows, maybe in your genre, 
maybe that support your show, maybe are next door, maybe they're following the show, however, however it makes sense, but it's about supporting those relationships because that's what all of this is. Yeah, if you go and look at the projects on the Fringe page, if something excites you and you know you can talk about it and, and talk it up to other people, you can send them a message, you can meet them at office hours, you can tweet at them yeah. and be like, hey, I'm really interested, would you, you know, just ask. And also, people the Fringe have a mixer after yeah. this about what their shows are like too. I also had a spreadsheet of uh, who was before and after me in my venue and I reached out to them specifically, if not for cross-promoting, just as a like, hey, this is my show, I'd love to see your show. Those are the kinds of people that you can target that are in your venue because then if they like it, they'll talk about it. And the Fringe site also has a great tagging system uh, where you can tag descriptors for your shows. Find out who else has got tags that are similar to yours and then that, that's a potential marketing buddy right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great tool for the solo shows, for all shows, but solo shows do that too where they bond together. Dramas do that where they, they kind of bond together. It's a great. Yeah. Raw yeah. enthusiasm will get you a long way. And, yep. and well, I mean, yeah. cut, uh, all the sh all the shows represented up here, I saw and, and loved and pushed. Uh, my whole cast died at the end of my show, so I couldn't do any talking <laughs> at the end of the show. But when you're out and about, that's part of the the cross promotion. I I talked to Hamlet Mobile so much to help them because I knew, like, where's the Hamlet book? I don't know, but here's how you find out, you know. Uh, yeah. But it it really is like part of what makes. Fringe special is we get to talk specifically about things we do know about. It's like, yeah, I saw that show. Go see that show. At the end of the night, we're going to shout out, thanks for coming to see us, support other Fringe shows specifically. We love da 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 da. The more, the more things you see and enjoy and speak well of also, and the less time you spend talking about yourself, or the equal amount of time you spend talking about yourself, the more well, the better that is received, generally. Just like being a human in the world in general. Yeah. Like, among, you amongst your fellow producers, the best way to market your show is, hi, I'm so-and-so, what's your show about? Yeah. Yeah. And then you listen. Okay, yeah. we've got five minutes, so I think we have just a few more questions, right? Okay, I'm gonna go with you right there. Go ahead, yep. yeah. Just a general question on patterns in terms of ticket pricing. Usually just for the previews and then the rest of the run, a lot of the shows tend to do the whole discounted thing throughout, or is it just the first show? For participants. Uh, discounts for for participants, I have discounts for, for the whole run. Uh, previews, paper it. Uh, regular price for the rest of the time, because that also gives your preview, like the incentive. You, you will see so many free shows during preview week, and that's awesome, yeah. because you are educated and you're intelligent, and you know what, what's out there, and you can talk up a whole bunch of stuff, and, and that's what's going to be uh, it's great because it gets buzz going for everybody. Uh, have the regular prices and then discounts for, for the rest of the run because people will buy regular price, full price tickets during your run. And if they see the marketing and they get that $2 off and everything, you know your marketing's working. We also, when we added shows, we had one that was really late at night and we discounted that just as an incentive to get people in the door because we have a show that starts at 12, yeah. like at midnight. It's mm -hmm. If it's $5 or then mm -hmm. off of $10, then people will be more likely. Matinees yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. 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 I kind of ride discounts the whole time, depending on the time of shows yeah. and how full it is, and yeah. this and that. Sales are going. And flash sales. Show run for uh, three hundred shows on average, four, six, eight, ten shows. Uh, yeah. Most most shows do five or six performances uh, with a preview included in that. I know we've done six performances with preview. We've done five performances with preview. That's about the average. We did six and then added two during the run. I know people who have done three and found that a really good number, like people with smaller shows and they knew that that, that was all they wanted, like they had one every single week and it sold out, it was great. So yeah, I think about the total very, number of seats. Yeah. So it's like, oh, 100 seat house, six shows, that's 600 seats, that's a lot. But it is a good idea to space them out as much as possible throughout the run of the festival. You don't want to have them all in the last week, for example. Oh yeah. gosh, I made that mistake. All right, there were three more questions over here. Yep. Excuse me, I just wanted to ask returning, uh, regarding the Trending's Joyce solo show as mayor. And I wanted to know, uh, in regards to like workers' comp insurance and accident insurance, what has been your experience with that? Is this, this workers' comp just cover your people? Does it cover uh, the audience as well? It's for just the general liability covers the audience and everything. General I think there's a million different insurance policies, and it's mostly about like thinking about what you specifically feel you need to cover. Because they'll insure you for almost anything. Yeah. yeah. So talk talk with your venue about that specifically. But yeah. And if you don't have employees, then getting workers comp like employees that you're actually going to give a W two to like workers comp doesn't really make sense. Volunteer accident coverage does make sense typically. I always 
carry liability, general liability, and volunteer accident. But, but that's just what I do. Do all what, what they said. Very good. <laughs> but you're, yeah. it may be included in your venue. Your venue may offer it. No, they don't. Oh, okay. Cool. Then, then a volunteer accident policy would be that. That's what we carry at Theater Unleashed, and that covers uh, our, our performers and our audience. Okay. But if you pay uh, somebody who's like you know uh, not an employee, but just for that for certain specific things like you know your safety. Is it under $600? I mean, <laughs> if, if it's just a, if it it's is, just a stipend, you can probably get away with it. They're still a volunteer if it's just a stipend. If you're not it's a little bit of a legal gray documents. area, but if they're not, yeah. Oh. So. Okay. If you're not going to give them tax documents, like if it's less than $600, $600, they don't have to report it on their taxes, and you don't have to report it. Oh, I so that's kind of the threshold I use. That being said, no one on stage here tonight is a leap. Is no, a that's not. No, we, we are not. Yeah, and so I would highly, highly, highly recommend, recommend yeah, yeah, yeah. beyond talking to peers or, or asking questions like this, do some research on the back end. Talk to your venue about what they would say is required. You want to make sure that you're protected in everything that you do. And depending on what your show is like, what your work is like, who's working with you on your team, these answers are going to be different for everybody. So do that research. OK, last question here in the front. Uh, we have a web page on the Fringe. Oh, done by six funny. Uh, we have a, a page on the fringe site. Mm -hmm. What's the best use of that page? And is there an advantage in having an additional page with the website page devoted just to our show? I would check out uh, Four Clowns. Their uh, pages on the fringe website from previous shows are a great mixture of telling you what the show is and also reviews and photos and making it a, a destination on the hollywoodfringe.org webpage for your show. I don't think you need to necessarily build a website unless you're trying to continue it on beyond after the fringe or that's something easy for you because the fringe website's really incredible. Yeah. You yeah. can post photos, you can post photos, sell tickets and you have a text box there. So the ma the primary function of it is to sell tickets. Okay, and that site was what now? Um, just on the hollywoodfringe.org uh, type in four clowns. Four clowns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, a, they're a case study for what to do right yeah. 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 And there was one more question here in the periphery that I missed. Did you have one? Uh, yeah. Hi, guys. How are you doing? I'm Kristen okay. from Two Cents. Um, I just had a question about, um, I want to put in on the performance of, oh, yeah, we're doing, we're doing Neil Bob the musical. If it is what that might be this year. Um, this is our second year at uh, Fringe, and I just wanted your opinions on uh, performance time. Off peak's your friend. Off oh, peak, off peak hours, off peak yeah. performance lots are your best friend matinees, because yeah. uh, matinees, late nights, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights. If you can get those, those are great because honestly, there's less shows going on. Everybody makes the mistake of trying to book Thursday, Friday, Saturday, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock. Uh, and there's just such a deluge of shows going on. And just remember, your audience members can only be in one place at a time. Right. Also, if you having different shows at different kinds of times, just target the performance time to your audience. So we knew like Monday night would be a great night for like industry people because no one has anything going on on Monday night. And if, if but if you know like it's going to be tough, like either discount it or just target it to a group of friends or people who would be more likely to go um, that a show A show where the actors are drinking all night, that's a late night show right there for the whole run, you know? Mm -hmm. It depends on who, yeah, your audience would be like, like if you're gonna invite Jesus. friends and family and coworkers from the office that you work in Monday through Friday, then there might be one night where a Saturday night game is great because you don't need it to be the French community at your show that night, yeah. pick and choose. Do you guys feel like the time our friends and specifically like, were a little similar to that world this year, like Friday, Saturday night, well, the variety, having a variety of times, yeah. and then you don't run into like eight o'clock Saturday night. This whole area is just going to be cars and people. It's going to be packed, yeah. and you're up against everybody who thought, oh, Saturday eight o'clock. Uh, so if you have a, a nice range, then people don't have to make a sacrifice for another hot mm -hmm. eight o'clock show. They can see you Tuesday at night. You can look at when we had our shows last year. I pulled out no Okay. We, yeah. I have to stop, you guys. We have to we cut it right there. I'm so Big sorry. Round Big round of applause for everybody.
go to three clubs. 